Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Coming up on today's show, we're going to find out why women are disproportionately affected by dangerous drugs and medical devices. Labor unions have been excluded from every major trade agreement, and we'll talk about how union involvement can help save lives, not just in America, but all over the world. And new evidence has emerged that shows the deceptive practices of mortgage companies. We'll bring you all the details on that story. We have all that and more coming up. And right now, remember, you've just stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. It has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> When it comes to dangerous drugs and medical devices, the majority of the negative side effects are harming female consumers in big numbers. Joining me to talk about Big Pharma's war on women is Linda Lipson from the American Association for Justice. Linda, more and more literature coming out showing what we've known all along, and that is the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the device industry. Uh, women uh, in a disproportionate, disproportionate numbers are the victims here. Uh, I, I know your organization has been following this for a long time. This is an old story. It's a sad story of, of women's health and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, basically, what has happened uh, for years and years and years, 60 years, is that women are underrepresented in clinical trials. Uh, and um, when, they, uh, when they endure a problem with a uh, pharmaceutical product, they go to their doctor and they're told that um, it's really, sometimes they're told it's really nothing. Um, the industry sometimes is not respond, responding to them, then more and more complaints mount. Um, and the industry, instead of just fixing it and, and, and making the product safer, they go into this um, cone of silence and obfuscate obfuscation um, and create uh, an environment where the, uh, the, the woman, where the patient is not, is not um, the first consideration. And they put, uh, time and time again, they put issues of, of, of greed over issues of public safety. And we think it's time for them to change things. But we see that we do, we do now know that historically, we do now know that historically, they have prevented women from being involved in the initial clinical trials. Now, you know and I know how important the clinical trials are. The clinical trials might be data that they decide this has the potential to cripple a person, to, uh, to, to kill a person, but they leave women out. Now, the, the case I think of that you have in, in, when the AAJ did a report on this, this was a very moving case. And it was the case with, with Accutane. And so what Accutane was simply a drug that they came up with for people to avoid, uh, to, to treat acne. It was a drug that was developed for cancer. And they said, gee, I know it's developed for cancer, but let's use it for acne. But they left women out of the clinical trials because they clearly knew. I've seen the documents and they clearly knew that it would cause birth defects in women. Tell us this story a little bit. Well, one very sad story of a woman, a young woman named Cammy, who basically took Accutane for mild acne, not even serious acne, um, and she took it and uh, and suddenly developed ulcerative colitis, um, and it caused her to endure uh, incredible pain. And Cammy died uh, in February of this year. And it's just a very tragic and horrible story. And and for Cammy, Cammy was taking the generic version of the drug Accutane. And in taking that um, generic version, um, because of a Supreme Court decision, Cammy cannot hold that manufacturer accountable. The Supreme Court um, basically said recently that if you have, if you if you consumer have taken a generic drug, um, you can't you can't you have no remedies. So we feel terribly for Cami, but there are countless other Camis. Um, well, the, the interesting thing about this, Linda, is uh, to me, and you covered this so well in your AAJ report, where you talked about the idea that you had a drug that was that, that they knew. Now we know because I've actually seen the documents. We've introduced them in trial where you, they knew that we have to keep women out of the clinicals because we know it's going to cause birth defects. And if somebody's pregnant, 
in the clinicals, then they're going to have birth defects and we're going to have to report that. But we see this not just with Accutane. The, the mesh, isn't the mesh case another example of this? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different product, obviously, but it is the same story. It's the same old story. Um, with um, this, this product for vaginal, which is called vaginal mesh, basically what it, what it, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't even regulated by the FDA as that particular product. They used a similar product um, and they basically got in through the back door. This product um, has been used by thousands and thousands of women. It causes um, infections. Um, and other serious problems, it has to be taken out. And um, what women are saying about the, uh, these surgeries that they have to extract it um, is it's a little bit like getting barbed wire out of concrete. So it's, it's, it's another example of women um, uh, trying to um, fix something and creating uh, more problems because the industry is not on their side. The well, industry in, in this situation, as a matter of fact, and you pointed this out, there was no testing. They, 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 here they're putting this product in a right. woman's, in a woman's body. Now right. it's cause, it causes deterioration of the bladder, it causes deter, deterioration of the uterus, all the parts of the body that, that you can't even get this product out. You described it as barbed wire out of concrete. Surgeons say there's so much damage when it goes in that it's virtually impossible for the best surgeons in this country to pull it out. But here again, women believed that it had been tested. Women thought that the FDA was looking to make sure it was safe. In fact, the FDA did nothing to even oversee the, the product uh, of mesh. And again, this is one of those issues where they understand that women have more health issues than men. They targeted women uh, just like they do with birth control. Isn't this another product we see time and time again with a birth control product that causes uh, heart disease, it causes DVTs, it causes strokes of all kinds. Women die, uh, I think in the last, the numbers I think in the last 20 years, there have been five birth control pills that have caused so many serious, uh, so, so many serious injuries that at this point, you don't know what, what a woman doesn't know what to take. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not just birth control, it's everything to do with reproduction and the pharmaceutical industry. You know, it started out with DES, moved on to Dalton Shield, then Copper 7, then we have Ortha Evra, uh, we have Yaz, um, you name it. It keeps going on and on. It's the same old story. Um, high um, uh, estrogen birth control pills uh, cause serious uh, problems that, that have led to strokes, uh, heart attacks, um, and other problems that have been known for years and years and years yet. Uh, this continues. Well, one thing that I thought was so important about your report, the AAJ, and, and people miss this. I, I, a lot of people don't even know what the AAJ is. They don't have any idea that it is the only line in the sand where it comes to real consumer protection. But the AAG, AAJ report that I read that I thought was so interesting was that in virtually every one of those examples that you gave, virtually every single one of them, in the file cabinets of the home headquarters for every one of these pharmaceutical industries or the, these device makers, they, there was discussion and they say, yes, we know the risk. We know it can kill a person with a stroke. We know the device is so dangerous we're never going to be able to get it out, there with, out of their body without mutilating them. We know these things, but the profit margin is so big that we'll be able to pay for all these losses and still make a big profit. Virtually every one of the products you just mentioned is, is a similar analogy, is a similar uh, set of circumstances, isn't it? Well, yes, and the Supreme Court is making it worse. Um, let's take the example of a young woman named Chrislin, um, who took the product Yaz uh, uh, for birth control. Basically, um, she started to develop blood clots, and she had to get surgery for, uh, for these blood clots, $50,000 in surgery um, costs, and she's living with a ticking time bomb because she has, she has these these this potential for blood clots that could occur any time. So this has just destroyed her personal life. Um, and she has 
enormous, enormous pain connected to, to now, this. Now, full one. disclosure, I know a lot about the Yaz case because I took the depositions over in Berlin and in Amsterdam. Here's what we found, and, I, and, and of course, what I thought was so remarkable was that you had already identified some of these problems in your AAJ research and investigation before we did. You gave us that information, it was very helpful. But what we found was that they, they had something they call emotional appeal marketing. And that is this, they were telling people like the, the, the young lady you're just talking about, that if you take our product, you're not going to have acne, you're going to be able to, your PMS problems are going to be solved. The FDA never gave them uh, the, the permission to say that the drug should even be used for that. The documents that we uncovered said, A, we know that the FDA has not permitted us to do that. B, we know that it's not true, that we, we've tested sugar pills and we've compared them to Yaz and the sugar pill is just as effective as Yaz where it comes to treating PMS. Now, the bad news to all of this is after, the, after those documents are uncovered, after it's clear that they know the product is going to kill women, they had a projection on how many women it would kill, they still, know, they, they still understand nobody goes to jail. When we took depositions on that case that you just mentioned over in Berlin, the surliness and the arrogance was overwhelming because the people who made the decision understood they would not go to jail. Uh, in about 30 seconds, uh, what, what's the cure here, Linda? How does a, what does a woman do to protect herself? First of all, Congress, Congress can go a long way towards fixing this. Um, they can uh, repair what the Supreme Court has done in the medical device area and in the generic drug area by making drug companies that put issues of greed over issues of public safety, make them accountable. Um, if not for the lawsuits that have occurred because of Yaz, because of Ortho Evra, because of DES, because of Dalcon Shield, because of Copper 7, if not for those lawsuits, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know about the dangers that these products sometimes cause. So we need to have a vibrant, civil justice system to work in tandem with the FDA and promote the best environment for, uh, for he healthy and safe women. And Linda, I got to tell you this, what we need is more people like Linda Libson up on the hill lobbying with the level of effectiveness that the AAJ shows time and time again. I don't know what we would do without the efforts of the AAJ, frankly. And, and I thank you for joining us. Thank you for this report. Please keep sending us the reports that you come up with because it's, it's vital information the public simply does not know about. Thank you for joining me. Coming up, we'll talk about how labor unions could have prevented recent tragedies in factories all over the world. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. You're watching Free Speech TV, a network powered by the people. Welcome back to Ring of Fire, I'm Mike Papantonio. Labor unions have been excluded from every major trade agreement and the lack of strong labor protection is becoming more and more apparent. I have attorneys Howard Nations and Mike Berg with me now to talk about how labor unions could have prevented worker deaths and other atrocities all over this globe. Howard, labor enforcement really does matter. We, saw, we, we see it time and time again with places like Bangladesh or China, uh, or Saipan. Uh, t tell us the Bangladesh story and then let's, let's explain how we are being made into a Bangladesh right here in the United States. Mike, the Bangladesh story is just outrageous. On April 24th of this year in Rana Plaza at Garment Factory, there was a collapse of the eight-story building. The interesting part of that and the outrageous part of that is the day before the inspectors had been in and the police had ordered the building to be closed because cracks were showing in the building. The uh, garment workers came back to work by, because they were ordered to do so. They were there. 1,129 were killed when the building collapsed the following day and 1,500 were injured. These were mostly young women who were being paid $37 per month. It's the worst disaster in the, in the history of global garment industry. Uh, it, it's a reminder, Mike, of what happened in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in uh, March of 1911 
in New York City. There were 146 deaths and 71 injuries there. As a result of that, all sorts of legislation came out and it's never happened again in the last 102 years in this country. But the refusal to take any action to stop it in Bangladesh, this is the third such incident in the last year. And this Rana Plaza is making garments for more than one dozen fashion brands, including Benita, JCPenney, and Walmart. Yeah, Michael, let me go to you on this. Uh, you remember, uh, you and I did a story a, a few years ago, I think it was a radio story, where we talked about Tom DeLay going to Saipan he gets to Saipan, he sees that people are working for a dollar a day. He sees they're working 18 hours a day. He sees they have no leave time. He sees they have no health care. Tom DeLay, senator from, uh, from Texas, along with a whole handful uh, of other Republican senators, they come back to the United States and they say, this is the model that works and this is the model we want in the united states do you remember that playing itself out right here on our cameras in the united states i do mike and and you know what's so horrible about it is they have actually put the plan in place they're getting rid of the labor unions who quite frankly protect our workers by making sure that they're safe they make sure the hours are are, are done right they they make sure there's no child labor uh, making sure they're enforcing that they've also dismantled osha that the plan is is to have Saipay or Bangladesh here in the United States and having workers working for pennies, making sure that they're working long hours and there's no protection. They want to impose that here. And we're going to have tragedies like this again in the United States if Congress and the people of the United States don't do something about well, it. Well, you know, Michael, uh, we, we see uh, people hear stories like this and they say, well, that's that's Bangladesh, that's China. The stories that Howard were just, uh, that he was just telling us, those are in other places. And we don't, we don't seem to grasp that the people who have been outsourcing all these years have figured out, why don't we just do that here? And so we, it, it begins obviously with undermining the public unions and then taking away the teeth from, from, the, from the, the national unions. Howard, uh, how do we enforce how does the United States ever get to the point to where we enforce any type of global labor rights when we almost just ignore the Wagner Act here in the United States? It's almost as if we have lost sight of how the American Union built America's middle class. We don't put much value in that. How do we ever enforce internationally? Well, you're absolutely right. For example, after the Bangladesh incident, our international enforcement was to reward Bangladesh and make them the second largest garment manufacturing country in the world. 160 million people, 4 million of them are in the garment business and they have 40 building inspectors over there. They have no rights, virtual slave labor. Now, in order to try to do something about it, there is a movement for corporate accountability. There are four different aspects of it. After the Rana Plaza collapse, uh, there was a great outcry so there, the things that will bring about change are the global labor movement. The domestic labor movement is in trouble, big trouble, because it's under attack by the Republican Party. But there's a global labor, labor movement, there's anti-sweatshop activists, and there is a labor-affiliated advocacy group called Workers' Rights Consortium. Now, they passed in earlier this year, they passed an accord on building and fire safety in Bangladesh. And in that accord, it's a legal contract. The big retailers and the producers are responsible for factory safety, and they've agreed to invest millions of dollars in safety and to give long-term contracts to the owners of the garment factories. The, it's backed up by independent safety inspections, and those uh, in safety inspections are made public. There's binding arbitrations, and they terminate business of a factory if it's found to be unsafe. It's yeah, Michael, let me go to you on this. Uh, the, the truth is you can have all the voluntary you want, but unless you have a government to government uh, dialogue, a narrative government to government, and the government says, listen, we're giving you some favored nations tariffs. 
We're, give, we're telling you, Bangladesh, as Howard was just talking about, we're telling you that we're going to put you on a list of favored nations that we're going to deal with. We're going to have, our out, we're going to have uh, corporations basically outsourcing, taking American jobs away from America and sending them to Bangladesh. And, and we're also going to give you tariff breaks in the process. Now, it, it, there, are you, without labor, without organized labor, they're to control wages, to control hours, con to control safety, to control wages. Where, where, does that, where does that really go? It really doesn't go a anywhere. We have the Fair Labor Association. They're trying to do it on a voluntary basis. It's not working. And it's not only Republicans. Clinton, with NAFTA, over the objections of the Democrats, they, they got NAFTA through, and, and this is where it all began. It began when the Clinton administration, in which they were trying to figure out how we're going to have lower costs for our products. And by going overseas and creating these sweatshops, we do have lower costs at the Walmarts, at the J.C. Penney's. But at what cost? The cost yeah. of lives. Michael, right on your topic there, you know, you see, we came away from the Clinton years thinking, oh, what a, what a, a hero this man is for the working man. And we missed the whole, a lot of people missed this. The media, media intentionally missed it. Uh, you had mainstream media intentionally missed the fact that what Clinton knew, he was being told directly. If you do this, if you open these trade agreements on NAFTA and CAFTA without any type of labor responsibility on the other end, the United States can never compete with, with this outsourcing. And we're going to have exactly these things that labor was telling us was going to happen in places like Bangladesh and China, uh, India, all parts of the world where you have these huge clothing manufacturers that really don't give a damn. You know, they have their PR, their, their PR machine saying, oh, yeah, we really care about how workers are treated. The, the history doesn't show that, does it, Michael? does not. In fact, in 2012, there was a fire in a garment factory in Pakistan. 300 people were killed. Uh, again, no one even talked about it. And, and the problem we have is people say we want to compete with the world labor market. And here in the United States, we're, we're starting to see again these kinds of problems because the unions are not there, the people are not unionized, and OSHA has been basically stripped of any power. And, and right now we have problems here in the United States exactly the same, and we're going to have tragedies like occurred in Bangladesh right here. Howard, go, let me go to you on this. You, you know, again, somebody watching this broadcast may say, you know what, this doesn't really affect me because it's over in... Uh, you know, over in Pakistan, it's over, you know, Bangladesh. I mean, uh, it's only these bleeding heart liberals that care that, you know, uh, that 1,500 women burn to death because there's no labor standards there. It doesn't really affect me, and I get to buy my shoes for less money. I get to buy my T-shirts for less money. Uh, but what they miss, Howard, and, and I'd like you to talk about this just a little bit, don't they miss the fact that in NAFTA in CAFTA, by definition, they defined health, safety, and welfare and labor issues as obstacles to free trade. And now we see that same language coming over here across the, the ocean to the United States, where we're seeing that same language as health, safety, and welfare of the workers is simply an obstacle. Aren't we seeing that more and more in the United States? You're seeing that here, and the lessons from Bangladesh and China are the lessons that we should be applying to Wisconsin. Because as the labor movement in these United States is under direct assault, and it's under assault and not getting the support from the Democrats, under assault from the Republicans, it's, it's in real jeopardy. And what is happening in Bangladesh can happen here if you do not have politicians who are willing to back labor politicians who are willing to take substantial risk of their own in backing labor unions and in and in shoring up labor unions. We have to have the labor unions and the assault on labor unions in this country is going to have absolutely devastating effects in our factories and across the board, even in our schools with our teachers. It's absolutely outrageous what's happening to the labor unions in this country. And it's going to take brave politicians, and it's going to take a movement from the American public 
to back labor. Right. Michael, let me go to you really quickly. In about a minute, I remember uh, a few years ago, you talking to me about the you, how, how pleased you were about the college movement in the United States actually doing more than our government where it comes to enforcing labor laws. Tell us really quickly what they did with the, with the Worker Right Consortium where they said you can't come on our campus unless you comply. Absolutely. It, it's been an amazing and we need that kind of groundswell which is basically we're not going to allow those products into the, uh, into the university. You can't come on, on campus. You can't interview unless you enforce safety laws and make sure that people are getting fair wages. We need that kind of groundswell from the American people. If, if we don't get it, uh, labor unions are in trouble and we're going to have our grandchildren working for pennies on the dollar and in unsafe work conditions. Yeah, in the situation I remember you recalled uh, that, that you talked about one time was Russell, you know, thought that they could elbow their way through and ignore labor law and college campuses said, well, you can do that if you want, but you will not sell your damn products on our campus and Russell backed down. Guys, this is another important story. Y'all covered it very well. Thank you for joining me. We'll continue talking about it because this year it'll become more and more important. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Coming up, we'll take a look at why politicians are completely ignoring the growing U.S. income gap. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. Tune into Free Speech TV for Democracy Now!, a national, independent, award-winning news program bringing you people and perspectives rarely seen on corporate media. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. The wealthiest Americans are sitting on trillions of dollars in cash. They aren't reinvesting, they aren't giving workers a raise, and they aren't spending. Joining me now to talk about how this affects our economy is Richard Escow, a senior fellow at the Campaign for America's Future. Richard, you've probably written more about the economic inequalities taking place in the United States than most writers. Uh, you always seem to get it right. You connected the dots in one of the articles that you did says the rich have too much money. And as I, as I gleaned from that, it is that um, the, the notion of economics requires that money be spread out from the bottom up rather than the top down. But you, you laid out some, some issues that I think are, are, are critically important. You, you laid out uh, uh, six or seven points that I want to talk to you about, about how all of this occurred in the United States. First of all, you start off with the, uh, with the, with the, the discussion about how a billionaire is able to buy the Washington Post. And why is that significant in your analysis as we go forward with this it, this incredible inequality in America? Well, it's significant for a couple reasons, Mike. Number one is because whereas in 1980 we had 50 five zero media companies providing content to 90% of the markets uh, for newspapers and broadcasts in this country, now we have only six. So, so this concentration of wealth creates a concentration of information, a concentration of opportunity, a concentration of political power that's just unhealthy for our society in every way. That's number one. And number two, the concentration of wealth among ultra-wealthy individuals like Jeff Bezos of Amazon has become so great that he can actually buy what's probably the second most influential newspaper in the country for what amounts to not much more than uh, pocket change for him, about one uh, 200th or 250th of his total reported wealth, and that's with more money coming in every day. That didn't just happen. But as God's will, it happened as a result of decisions the government made about economic policy, and that's something we really need to look at. Well, well for example, just take Bezos, for example, a uh, great example, uh, tax policy. I mean, look at how tax policy, economic uh, tax policy in the, in the United States empowered him to a point that we haven't seen since the Gilded Age. I mean, is, th did I get that right? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, for one thing, of course, Amazon uh, benefited at, from the tax loophole where people weren't paying sales tax 
uh, on everything that was purchased on Amazon, but then there are all the tax breaks for billionaires, all the tax breaks for corporations. Corporate taxes are at historic lows in terms of the modern history. Uh, the individual income tax for billionaires is at historic lows. You know, it kind of cracks me up when Rick Perry or somebody says, I miss the country I grew up in in the 1950s. Well, in the 1950s, the top tax rate for a billionaire was 93% or 91%. So if you really miss it, Rick, and you really wonder what's different now, you ought to be pushing to get higher tax rates. You know, Richard, as, I, as I've read your material over the years, you've always come up with this theme that are we getting so rich, uh, is that top, that top tiny 1% or less in the United States getting so rich that they actually don't even know what to do with their money? Talk about that. I, I've, it, it, it is important because if they don't know what to do with their money, it's lost to the economy, isn't it? Well, absolutely, and they literally don't know what to do with it. You know, we've, we've been told for so many years this money will trickle down, this money will create jobs. Now the, the figure is 37%. In other words, the richest people in this country, and by the way, that's not just billionaires, but that includes people in the more modest, uh, you know, half a million to a million range, from relatively more modest, that, that, the, that the wealthiest people in the, this country are now just hanging on to 37%, more than a third of the money they bring in. They're not investing it. They're not spending it. They literally don't know what to do with it. So if we so, assume they have 60% uh, or so, let's say 60% of just cash on hand, that's money that we used to see move through, through the economy, we, uh, economy by way of taxes, by way of uh, investment in the United States rather than in other countries, by way of investment into things where we build bridges, we build cars, we build infrastructure, rather than building uh, just toxic garbage trash called uh, CDOs or synthetics, uh, imaginary money. So they're holding on to that money and it doesn't move through the economy in any, any form or fashion. Uh, but the, the other part of it is just the corporate profits. I mean, if you look at uh, corporate profits and you look at the distinctions between those corporate profits today and just in our recent history, we, it's startling, isn't it? Well, it is because corporate pro uh, profits have skyrocketed even since the financial crisis of 2008. They're now at record highs, while corporate tax rates, the real tax rates, the money that gets collected, stands at record lows. At the same time that this company, that this country is struggling to create jobs for unemployed workers, at the same time that wages for the vast majority of Americans have stagnated, at the same time that ownership of of the wealth of this country has gone disproportionately up to the one percent which now owns 20 percent of the national wealth unless you're in new york city in which case it's 40 percent of, of the city's wealth so we've seen this massive upward distribution we've seen when money does get invested as you mentioned it gets invested in wall street and banking and speculation and and that's now on track to become half of all the corporate profits in this country are going to be from banks and hedge funds and financial institutions and not from companies that make things, sell things, and hire people to do it. We're getting into a very distorted, bloated, uh, wealth-friendly, super wealth-friendly economy that's really devastating uh, large portions of this country and its people. You know, Richard, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald understand, understood the, really the ugliness of, of the Gilded Age. He really kind of understood what robber barons can do to this country. Uh, you, you know, his, everything from Great Gatsby to several other things that he wrote talked about the glitz. It talked about the, the remarkable access and the remarkable spending of these nouveau billionaires. We're seeing that now more than, we, than I can remember in my lifetime. And uh, give me your take on that, would you? Oh, absolutely. Look, you know, every Gilded Age has its... Uh, it's embarrassing excesses. A diamond as big as the Ritz, if you remember, right? right. right. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, wish we had that much taste nowadays. I mean, <laughs> one of the things I wrote about that got a lot of controversy was the internet billionaire Sean Parker, who a lot of people remember from the the uh, the movie about Facebook. Uh, the guy who said, "Now a billion dollars is cool." Uh, the guy he <laughs> swears he never says that, and and he never said that. In fairness to him, but he had a wedding that cost about four and a half million dollars, where he used a glade that was environmentally protected by the California Coastal Commission. Long story short, wound up paying two and a half million dollars in fines 
for the environmental damage that he caused, and while at the same time, while so many people are struggling in this country, hired the costume director from the Hobbit movies so that everybody could wear a costume and have a Hobbit experience while they went into this glade and he got married. In a way, it's kind of sweet. And he sang to his wife a song from <laughs> The Little Mermaid, uh, which to me isn't worth another two and a half million in fines, but that's just a matter of taste. But it shows how there's just, they live in a different world. They really do nowadays, the ultra rich. And, and, and Sean Parker was very upset that people were... Uh, disturbed by this. Well, he was upset was... at your writing. He was upset at Andrew Leonard, who I think you've talked about also. Uh, Andrew Leonard said, look, it's not, it's not, we, we wish you well, Sean. We want you to do well. <laughs> Some of this you've actually earned. Uh, other has come th through just bad uh, U.S. economic policy, but some of this you, you've earned. But you have to understand the shock and the anger that pervades people who can't pay for their house payment, who can't afford to send children to college. And it's almost a rework of that that age that F. Scott Fitzgerald captured so well in things like Gatsby and uh, Diamond as Big as the Ritz. It, 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 it's almost a repeat of that. And I, I, what effect does that have on us as a culture, do you think? Well, if you combine that with the fact that we've got a lot of people out there who respond to the stress of their daily life by identifying with the extreme rich, and so you have the whole a kind of lifestyles as rich and famous is where I, I think of it as starting, but this whole Kardashian and reality show escapist fantasy that people have, so they identify with the wealthy, they fantasize they'll be there someday. Then you have the attitude of the 47% video that Mitt Romney made, where people are genuinely, the wealthy, a lot of the wealthy people in this country are genuinely indignant at the idea, like Sean Parker was, that anybody might question the excess. Then we have, we start to have a culture where people are struggling and yet worshiping wealth instead of working for a society that's just for everybody. You know, you can have both. Nobody's saying uh, that there shouldn't be an opportunity to get rich in this country. You just have to make it reasonable and balanced. Colonel Tom Parker, you know, Elvis's manager, said, said, I consider it my patriotic duty to keep Elvis in the 90% tax bracket. Well, that's the kind of rich people we need. That, that's my position. <laughs> well, there's this, there, there, is this, uh, there is this economic Darwinism that says, you know what, Sean, you built it. You're entitled to spend it any way that you want. And it is almost the survival of the uh, of the fittest. Uh, the critics on the other side uh, kind of an, have an arrogant way of saying, we are different. We're not waiting for the damn lotto. We went out and built it. We invented it. It's ours. We're not the lotto mentality. We're smarter than you are. We're more motivated. We're more engaged. Uh, I, think, I think when you really drill down on all that, you and I, might understand that there's a lot of fallacy there, but the average American watching Kim Kardashian on a 250 foot yacht says, well, gee, you know, she's Kim Kardashian, she deserves it. Well, I, I would say, you know, more people would understand that Kim Kardashian might not deserve it, but they might not have that thought about some of the internet billionaires, a lot of whom got, now Jeff Bezos is a smart guy, a lot of them got there somewhat by accident. The next time somebody says to me that this is survival of the fittest, I'm going to say, not as long as a billionaire sings a song from The Little Mermaid, it ain't, okay? <laughs> That's number one. But number, seriously, you have a lot of people in the internet world who are bright and talented, but not a hundred thousand times brighter and talented than other folks out there. Facebook is called Facebook because that's what they used to hand out at colleges when you, when you enrolled, picture of all your classmates. Mark Zuckerberg didn't it, see it the evolved. future. In other words, and, the American public helped it evolve and helped build that is your point. Sure, okay. and, so, and, and, and to a certain extent they got lucky. Yeah, well let me ask you something. Luck's okay, but what about when it's luck plus control over government? Isn't that one of the big, big cards you have to talk about in about 40 seconds? Tell me your thought. Well, absolutely. We've got a system now with Citizens United and more control over the government and the media than ever before, what we see, what we hear, what our representatives do. So absolutely. It's the, bil it's the billionaire class doing that is, is your point. It's the billionaire class doing it, rigging the game in their favor, and then saying they were born to be winners. 
Yeah, so when you control government at both the federal and we see it at the state level, if you, as you've pointed out in your writing, it is remarkable to find that, uh, you know, most of the money, $350 million probably in dark money, $1.6 billion in upfront d donations, and we take a look at where that comes from, it's about 31,000 people that, right. that are driving that money. Richard Escal, as usual, brilliant work. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, good to be here. When we come back, we'll find out how big banks falsify documents to illegally foreclose on millions of Americans. I'm Mike Papantonio, and you're watching Ring of Fire. We'll be right back. Ring of Fire. Ring of Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. New evidence has emerged that shows that some of the nation's largest banks have actually falsified documents to illegally foreclose on homes. Joining me now to talk about this scam is investigative journalist David Dayen. David, $95 million sounds like hardly anything when you look at the scams that the banks have been pulling off to try to, defor to defraud mortgage holders and, and foreclose on their mortgage. Tell us this story and tell us how you ever justify something is l just pence. $95 million is nothing. Yeah, it really isn't a lot of money, especially when you consider the enormity of this crime. You know, Lynn Simoniak uh, was someone who was in foreclosure she uh, examined her own documents, found them to be fraudulent. She happened to be a white-collar crime expert. She was an expert witness in insurance fraud cases. And she looked at her documents, her mortgage documents, found them to be fake, uh, started doing a little more digging, and found uh, most of the documents she found to, in fact, be fake, and then discovered the reason that millions of mortgage documents all over the country were, were in fact fabricated or even forged. And the reason is, is that in the peculiarities of the securitization process, that was when mortgages were bundled up and packaged into bonds. And yeah, they call them, call them CDOs, synthetics, they call them swaps, and all it was was, was toxic, fraudulent uh, paper is, is really all it is. So in there, so in there, I, I followed your story. It was very well presented. It was, it, was, it was easy to follow. They have these mortgages. They want to sell the mortgages, so they bundle them up together. And the problem is what they did was illegal, and they lost, they lost the chain of command. They lost the chain of where, who owns the mortgage. And then the banks came back and just fraudulently made stuff up. Is that, does that kind of lay out what happened here? Yeah, uh, there, there's a very particular thing you have to do. If you want to securitize a mortgage, you have to physically convey the mortgage from the originator, the person who sold the mortgage, the originator of the mortgage, into the trust, which is where, where basically the mortgage pool, where all the mortgages are held. And that has to be endorsed, like you would endorse a check, physically conveyed over to a custodian of documents for the trust. And they just didn't do this. They just didn't do it, and, and because they didn't do it, within a certain window of time, it basically breaks that chain of ownership, and you have these mortgage-backed securities that are, in fact, non-mortgage-backed securities. Okay, so, so the, the two, pro two problems. First of all, they, I, I, my memory is it's something like 90 days where everything has to be perfected, they say. In other words, if you say, we've bundled up this, the, these mortgages, we're calling them CDOs, we're calling them swaps, in order to do that, you have to have somebody, a trustee, holding on to the actual paper. And that has to be perfected within 90 days. 
They didn't do that because the banks were in a feeding frenzy. They were making so damn much money by the minute, they didn't pay attention to any of that stuff. So after the fact, after we, after we burned down trillions of dollars of the economy, after P the Goldman Sachs and the Citicorps and all the major banks burned our economy down, then they went back, some of these organizations, and tried to fraudulently convey and create new documents. Is that kind of laid out? Right. They created basically phony mortgage assignments. They backdated the assignments. They forged names just to get them out as fast as possible. Uh, and they did all this to cover up the main crime, which was the failure to convey the mortgages to the trust. Well, that's SEC problems, too, isn't it? In other words, if you're conveying something by way of, of, of an SEC document, something that has to be permitted by the SEC and has to be regulated by the SEC, and that's fraudulent. You've simply lied about what the underlying value of it is. The truth is the document that was bundled up in those securities had no value, zero value, because A, you didn't know who owned the document, B, the trustee that was supposed to be holding the document as a securitization didn't have possession of it. And the worst thing about it, again, David, nobody has gone to jail on it. Who are some of the players in this case? Name some of the players that really should be in jail over this. Sure. I mean, the trustees, there were 28 different organizations that were named in Lynn Simoniak's case. And those are the trustee banks. Uh, they are the bank servicers who are the, the companies hired uh, to handle the day-to-day -day operations on, on mortgages and then foreclose if need be. Uh, and also law firms who were involved in the processing and, and, and prosecuting of these foreclosures uh, who were also uh, dealing with false documents. And, you, and actually had law, you actually had at every level, matter of fact, law firms, you had law firms that absolutely knew that the documents had been forged, that robo-signers working for these banks had made these documents up, had created names, had signed names to, to these documents. The law firms clearly knew that was going on and chose to ignore it, it actually participated in it. They, too, are really part of a criminal conspiracy, and still they haven't gone to jail either, these law firms that, that created part of this. They haven't gone to jail, haven't really faced any bar complaint. I mean, this is, this is the presentation of false evidence before a court, uh, and, and so they, they absolutely should be sanctioned for that. And as you talked about with investors, uh, investors were certainly harmed because there's a lot of expense that goes into having to try to backwards uh, justify uh, the ownership of a, a, a property, if, if you're trying to foreclose on it. There's, there's tons of expense involved there. Uh, in terms of the U.S. government, there are guarantees when a mortgage fails that they get to collect on, but they're collecting on it using false documents, so the U.S. government is harmed by this. And, and David, the homeowner who's being foreclosed on has no idea that all these, that a lot of times these documents they're using to foreclose are absolutely fraudulent documents created by the banks, created by the middle agents, and created by the law firms that have been involved in this conspiracy. And to this day, nobody has gone to jail. Going forward, though, there is the possibility of a big civil suit. Uh, David, thank you for joining us. As usual, you're covering stories that no other reporters out there are covering, that they and they certainly should be covering stories like this. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Elderly Americans are facing a serious threat in the form of abuse at nursing homes. The epidemic has been steadily growing in recent years, and I'm joined now by attorney Charles Meltmar, who's handled litigation against abusive nursing homes. Charles, there's an epidemic in the United States right now because the baby boomer, boomers are coming of age. They're having to find a place in their retirement years where they can feel safe, they can feel secure. If they have to go to a nursing home, they can go to a nursing home. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States right now, that's a bit of a disaster, isn't it? It is, it is Mike. And what families could do to make sure that their loved ones are cared for is to go to Medicare.gov and type in nursing home compare and they can see there how their nursing homes compare to other nursing homes in the area. That way they can ensure that their loved ones get the best care available. But what's happening, I mean, the, part of it is you have people with minimal qualifications that are in, in charge of uh, many of these nursing homes. 
They have inadequate staffing almost across the board. You have insufficient training of people that has that almost become epidemic. In, in, you, you put them in there in very important jobs and they simply don't have the training. And then you have low wages and high turnovers. Now, if you take all of those facts, what you're talking about here is corporate America. The Goldman Sachs types are now involved with maintaining nursing homes in this country. Did I get that right? Well, that's true. There are nursing home chains across the United States that own three to 400 facilities, and they're looking at the bottom line for each facility. They're putting emphasis on filling the facilities up and not so much emphasis on providing quality care to the people inside the facility. Well, it's like the rest of the privatization. Here you have government, you have Medicaid, Medicare paying for, taxpayers are paying 75% of the bill here. But nevertheless, corporations are taking that money and the numbers that I saw, they're keeping anywhere between 20 to 25 cents of every dollar that is paid into that nursing home. And they're trying to cut cost as much as possible. Now, you're an experienced, uh, you've had the experience of having to go toe to toe with these nursing homes time and time again, where you've had individuals. Uh, your last case that you handled, uh, a man was horribly burned simply because of, if you add it up, it was inadequate staffing, inadequate training, and this man was burned, uh, burned uh, horribly, almost died because of it. That's not unusual to see in a nursing home setting, is it, because of the new privatization of that whole process? Well, in, in my case, the resident that was admitted into the facility had been there four months earlier and smoked in violation of their non-smoking policy. He hurt himself again, and the nursing home administrator saw on an Internet um, that this gentleman was available to be transferred back into the facility. She contacted the corporate management of the nursing home and told her that this resident was non-compliant with the no smoking policy. And it was her testimony at trial that she was instructed to readmit, it, readmit this resident back into the facility because they had too many empty beds. But, but, but the, po the point being, what I'm, I guess, Charles, the bigger picture is we see this repetitive process of you have an industry here that is $87 billion a year industry. It, it, is that number just about somewhere in the range of $87 billion a year. That's what, that's what changes hands. But anytime you have a corporation that is trying to make a profit, the first thing they're going to do is cut staffing. They're going to have minimal qualified people. They're going to have low wages. They're going to have high turnover. You simply can't do that in a setting where people need this kind of care, can you? No, I mean, it's very difficult to for corporations that aren't going to pay adequate salary to hold on to people that have the skills necessary to care for the, um, the residents in the facility. And sometimes they make decisions to admit residents that they can't adequately care for, like the case that I just went to trial on. They took in a, non, a smoker into a non-smoking facility and just didn't watch him, and they took him outside at 5 o'clock in the morning and left him alone, and he was horrifically burned. And that kind of decision to admit a resident like that is made at the corporate level simply to increase profits and fill their beds. Uh, we, the, the numbers that I'm looking at, it's more than 30 percent of nursing homes in the United States, uh, about 5,000 uh, nursing homes, were cited with something as severe as abuse violations. In other words, this is, this is beyond a lack of, this isn't just lack of competence. This is where the, the, the individual had been abused, intentionally abused in the nursing home. And part of that is because we have let regulations go out the window on how we oversee these nursing homes during a time when, uh, when one out of three nursing homes uh, in this country are, are responsible for things such as intentional abuse. Why is that happening today in America? We've got all these people, an elderly population moving in, needing nursing homes. Why is it now that we have such deregulation? From my personal experience, what I see is that staff members are not adequately trained on how to care for demented or Alzheimer's patients. They don't know how to redirect them. And what happens is that the caregivers who are not adequately trained become frustrated and, and react in a violent or semi-violent way, which also ultimately re results in an abuse citation and the facility being put into a special focus category. And legislators at this point, uh, the way I'm looking at this, Charles, legislators at this point receive a huge amount of money, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars a year from the nursing home industry for one thing, 
and that is to make certain that we further deregulate the oversight in nursing home. Has that been, has that been your experience? What I've observed is that there is different levels of oversight in different states. The states take the Medicare money or the Medicaid money and allocate it as they see fit. In some states, there's better oversight than others. I don't want to identify states for you. Um, well, Florida for, Florida, for example, is horrendous. California is horrendous. Uh, you, where, where did you get your last verdict? In Virginia. And Virginia does not have, um, in my opinion, the most aggressive uh, oversight of the nursing homes in their uh, in the state and what happens is a lot of times in Virginia people fall between the cracks because the surveyors are just aren't in the buildings. So the only thing that we can do here is keep putting pressure on legislators say look we know they're paying you off by paying you a lot of money but this is my father this is my mother these are my relatives that are going to this nursing home and we expect better. Uh, Charles thank you for joining me. Thank you. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.